provide? Yes, care? absolutely, okay. absolutely. Uh, there are certain things in the Oregon Constitution that the state is required like, to do. You're, you're, schools, okay, good. Schools specifically mention schools. Uh, counties are supposed to take care of human service needs along with the state, but when they can't do it, then the state has to pick up more of those costs. State is required to have a prison system uh, and have state police. We've cut way back on the number of state police we have in this state. Um, in 1980, we had over 650 troopers on our highways. Today, it's 400. Wow. A third, over a third less, and the population's gone up 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, that really concerns me, and that really has the greatest impact on the rural parts of the state where their sheriff's offices are closing down and where they can't afford to fund local uh, municipal police uh, officers or county sheriffs like we can here in, in Multnomah County in Portland. Why is it such an issue? I mean, can't well, it It's an issue because the funding system was established at a time when we were a resource reliant state, when we were, timber was all of the money. And some of these counties were cutting a lot of trees and there was a tax on timber, uh, timber that is cut, severance tax, and it provided them with plenty of money. And so then when the property tax limitations went in, they froze in place the existing rates. Well, those rates in many of those counties was very, very low, like $6 a thousand, $7 a thousand, a very, very low rate when it's frozen in place. And then your other revenue from timber goes away, you're in deep trouble. How much, when I think about the dollar, the number of dollars that goes into this pot, if you will, the, the collection of taxes, i.e., or the collection of rent, uh, naturally you have to pay your bills first. Yeah. How much, uh, if, if you don't mind, if you can break that dollar down in terms of how much do we have to pay for, for not, not just services that are active service, but you know, you got retirements and this, that, and people that are retired, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. How much of that dollar is left that we can use, if you will, to pay, it, pay our bills? Well, uh, our total tax revenue in this state is l less than the national average. Total state and local taxes in Oregon is less than the national average. Used to be above the national average. It's been declining with respect to the national average. We're somewhere around 30th out of the, right. out of the 50 states in terms of our uh, state and local tax revenues. Um, so are our services better? than some other states, maybe to a degree, mm -hmm. but we've really been cutting back on school funding, which troubles me a lot. Mm -hmm. Our university system and our community colleges, you know, I'm on the Mounted Community College Board, mm -hmm. and those, those uh, community colleges and, and our universities have had to raise their tuition over and over again, making it more costly and more difficult for lower income students to get a college education. And that's how they're going to raise themselves up for their bootstraps. So there's a lot of things that trouble me about the financing in this state. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you brought in education. Let's just jump right in there. I, I, it, for some reason, we got in sort of a historical thing. We looked like oh. an historical piece with, when, when Governor Kitzhopper basically was able to, he wanted to t tackle this whole issue of education. Yeah. What was that all about? Can you yeah, define that well, on the front I, end? Well, what I was chair of the, of the um, education subcommittee of sure. Ways and Means, which means I'm in charge of budgeting for all education from preschool, Head Start, all the way through the university system. So I was one of those, along with Senator Hass, that worked very closely with the governor in crafting his plan and in getting it passed. Now, the plan did not create any more money because nobody this session wanted to raise taxes. But what we did is we made several reforms that I think will make more efficient use of the money we have. Okay. So if you don't have enough money, at least use the money you have well. Mm -hmm. And I think we've done that. Uh, so we've invested more in early childhood education, zero to five-year-olds. You understand that if we can get kids a good start by the time they're five, if they're ready to enter kindergarten, by the time they're six, if they're ready to learn to read, by the time they're seven, if they're reading, and by the time they're third grade, if they are reading so that they can learn, we talk about learning to read and then reading to learn, by the third grade they ought to be reading to learn. If we get them that head start, they're not gonna end up in our judicial system. They're not gonna end up dropping out of school and becoming 
uh, a burden on society and a burden on their families. So the governor was absolutely right, put a high priority on investing in early childhood programs. So what, what we found was that early childhood programs were scattered all over the state budget. And that's not very efficient. So the governor's plan consolidates them all into you know one aspect, one agency, and then put himself in control with the legislative control. Uh, you know, we've always had an elected state school superintendent separate from the governor, hmm. doing her or his own thing. Hmm. And sometimes that was okay, but since the governor and the legislature are the ones that are really responsible for education, and they're the ones that get the credit or the blame if it doesn't go right, it made sense to me to have the superintendent be in effect the governor who then will appoint the best, smartest education administrator he can find to run that agency and run it as a part of the rest of the governor's office and the, the legislative programs. So we went that way. We also did things like provide for full day kindergarten because we know there's huge difference in kids that have had only half day kindergarten program or those that have had a full day program. By the time they get to the third grade, they're much more likely to be able to read at grade level if they had that full day kindergarten program. Half day kindergarten program is only a matter of about two and a half hours. It's just not enough to give them the readiness that they need. So by 2015, every school district in this state will have full day kindergarten. Uh, that's something I've been working on for decades. When I was when I was chair of the David Douglas School Board, I got David Douglas to start uh, providing full day kindergarten. They've done it ever since. It's been tremendously successful. The other thing we did is uh, reform of our education service districts. Now ESDs, they scarf about 5% of the total school funding right off the top, and they spend it, some on very good programs, you know, for handicapped kids and so on, mm -hmm. but much of it on wasted high administration, okay. uh, $150,000 salaries for administrators and so on. A lot of duplication, and especially in like, say, the Portland area, mm -hmm. where the school districts are large, Portland School District number one, David Douglas is the 10th largest in the state, Centennial's pretty large, Gresham Barlow's pretty large. All those are large school districts mm -hmm. that can really already have administration and can provide the needs for special needs kids much more efficiently than the ESD is currently. And so what we said is, okay, if you want to opt out of the ESD, you get 90% of the money that's been going to that ESD and you can use it to provide the necessary um, support for, for needed students. So that's another bill that we passed that I think made a lot of sense. And then the governor felt like very strongly that we need to give our universities a little more independence. Uh, currently, the universities under the uh, Department of uh, Higher Education can raise their tuition. We limit, the legislature limits how much they can raise it. But if they raise it and they collect it and they're frugal and they save some of it and the state's economy goes in the toilet, legislature can go and grab it. That didn't seem right. You know, if the students who pay that tuition, uh, they ought to benefit directly in better educational programs. So under the new bill that we passed, every university will still have control over its own tuition, capped by the legislature, but whatever they raise, they get to keep and they get to use. And if it earns interest, they get to keep the interest hmm. and use it for educational programs. That's a change. It is a change. The, the legislation also provides for a much closer coordination between high schools, community colleges, and universities. You know, many to give students kind of a, a, a clear path to higher education. Many students are ready to start doing college work by the time they're junior in high school. I used to teach those for 21 years. Mm -hmm. I taught advanced mm -hmm. placement history and government. They were doing college level work, believe me, I was rigorous. Uh, and, but having a way for them to, to transition to a community college or a university at, while doing college level work, either on the high school campus or to actually do college level work on the college, local mm -hmm. college campus, makes sense to me. 
uh, and providing a better transition and also guaranteeing that if a student goes to PCC and gets credits and decides they want to go on and go to Portland State and become an um, engineer or a teacher, that we guarantee that those credits are transferable, completely transferable. Mm -hmm. Not the case yes, today. Yes, yes. Today it's all up to the individual colleges or whether they have signed agreements. And that's true with private colleges as well. I've had some, I do work also with Warner Pacific College, which is a fine private college. So we need um, an education system, a higher ed system that allows for flexibility, but allows for a continuity mm. so that nobody loses anything and that we minimize the, the costs and allow the institutions the savings uh, from their own uh, ability to, to administer more efficiently. You know, when you guys were going through this discussion, both men and women were going through these discussions, I'm, I'm sort of reminded of the OEA, Oregon Educational Association. I'm reminded of the, uh, the, the various other educational educational entities mm -hmm. like uh, charter school folks, mm -hmm. uh, homeschool mm -hmm. folks, and this, that, mm -hmm. Were they at the table, and what kind of feedback? And I'm, I'm thinking about the, the governor, and I'm thinking about yourself, and, oh, you and all the others. How, how was that discussion going? And did, 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 did you guys compromise, if you will? Uh, absolutely. Everybody was at the table. It was at the table. And not everybody got everything they wanted. Okay. In fact, nobody got everything they wanted. Okay. Um, and in putting this education package together, essentially you had five entities that had to be pleased. You had the House Republican Caucus, and they wanted certain things. Uh, they wanted to strengthen charter schools and, and also uh, um, uh, online, online education and transferability and so on. Then you had the House Democrats, and they just wanted more money plowed into the K-12 budget. More money, gotta have another 100 million. Uh, and then you had the senators, especially Senator Hass and myself, who had been working very hard on full-day kindergarten and on ESD reform, and we wanted those to be included. And then you had the governor with his plan primarily for early childhood that I talked about and for higher education. All of those had to be sort of satisfied. And it was Peter Courtney, oh, Peter. Senate, Senate President Peter Courtney, yeah. that kind of put this deal together, talking to everybody, and then we came down to voting. And the very and of course, some of these bills not all of us liked. Uh, but the very first bill, one of the controversial bills that the Republican caucus in the House really wanted was a 30-30 vote. Didn't pass on the first vote. So, Peter Courtney and the governor and others kind of went to work and you kind of twist arms a little bit and you kind of talk talk about a little bit, you know, and uh, pretty soon the whole package passed. Every single bill passed. Not er not every I didn't vote for every one of them. Not everybody had to vote for every one of them, but the pledge I had with Peter Courtney was that I would make sure they passed. At the end of the day, you, you, you had, I would you make had sure a, they passed. Everybody was there. You everybody know? was there. So, so it's if good. it's got if it's got 16, 17 votes in the Senate without my vote, that's okay. But if not, then I better be there. Okay. Tell you what we'll do. We're going to take a short break. Again, I'm, uh, my guest today is uh, Senator Rod Monroe. We'll give an overview of the entire legislature this last time around and also we're sort of comparing the national stuff. But I thought it would be best to think about home first. And so uh, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to continue the interview with Senator Rod Monroe. Be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.